and introduce our presenter. We are very excited today to have Tom Manganello, who is a senior counsel for the Office of Investor Education and Advocacy with the United States Securities and Exchange Commission to talk to us about investments and how we can help ourselves today. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tom. Thank you, Sue, very much for having me today. Uh, thank you for everyone who's participating live or on Facebook. Uh, I w am an attorney. I work for the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, and it's important to note that the uh, views and the words that I express today are my own, not the views of the Securities and Exchange Commission, our commissioners, or my fellow staff. Uh, also important to note that um, we are uh, not providing legal advice today and not even uh, investment advice, strictly speaking, but we are speaking about tenets of smart investing. Uh, and as a regulator of uh, participants in the securities industry, of course, what we're providing is product neutral and unbiased. Uh, we are not endorsing any particular investment or uh, bank product. This is what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk a little bit about managing debt and credit. Uh, because it's important to consider that before we begin our investing journey. Then we'll talk about some of the components of saving and investing, such as how money grows, uh, the important concepts of diversification. We'll touch on asset allocation, uh, and we'll talk about why fees matter, of, of course, as well. Uh, we're also going to talk about the number one reason many of us invest, and that's planning for retirement, planning for a day when we no longer work and we live off the uh, assets that we've been able to acquire throughout our career uh, for the rest of our life. And then finally, I want to talk about fraud and scams because no matter how sophisticated we become, there's always going to be somebody uh, who would gun for our money or try to deceive us to steal our money. So we want to know what those red flags are and we want to be able to avoid them. Important to note that everything I say today is covered in more depth on our website for Main Street investors, and that website is investor.gov. If we have financial educators here, I hope you've already bookmarked that, and I hope you're using that when you work with clients. Uh, if you're a, an investor, whether you're just starting your journey or you're well along the way, investor.gov has great tools and resources at, that you can use at your fingertips uh, when when you wanna dive in. And I hope you'll take a look at that on your phone or your PC. Okay, the reason we have to talk about debt and credit is because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense uh, if to invest in a mutual fund, for example, that might pay you six or 8% interest over time or six or 8% returns over time, if at the same time you're not paying off your credit card bill every month and you're paying back to Visa or Discover or MasterCard, 8%, 10%, 12%, 14% in interest because you haven't paid off your balance. Or God forbid you're paying off a retailer's credit card like Home Depot or Macy's or H&M and you're paying 18%, 20%, 24% in interest every month. That's going in reverse. And so the first thing we wanna do is consider where we are in showing financial discipline living within our means, not overspending, not living a lifestyle that our salary won't afford. And if we have that high interest debt, we need to pay that off. Now, debt is not all bad. Credit cards are not all bad. There are some good and positive things to using credit cards. For one, they're convenient. Um, you can just put the card in the machine. Uh, the bill's gonna come in about three weeks. If you pay that off, you establish a credit score. And if you do that with some regularity, you improve your credit score. Uh, for another, you can earn points or cash back. Uh, you can challenge an erroneous charge and get your money back. Um, uh, and you can afford to buy things that you don't have the cash for right now because you can put that on your credit card and you can pay it off over some period of time. So those are benefits to having a credit card and using credit. But there are disadvantages, especially for those of us who are not able to show discipline, not able to live within our means. Why? Because a credit card makes it incredibly easy to access borrowed money. Uh, it feels great when you're first using it. Of course, when you use a credit card, it actually releases endorphins. It feels like you've eaten chocolate. It's a good feeling. I, I think because the pain of the transaction is a little bit divorced from that moment that you're sliding the card in the reader. Um, 
The pain comes a little bit later when you have a bill and you have to pay that off. Um, and for a lot of people, that presents a problem because it seems so easy. Uh, it takes you about two seconds to use your phone and incur a charge on Amazon or somewhere else. Uh, so we need to show discipline. If we can do that, credit can be a positive force in our life. Now, of course, when we do use credit, it costs money. If you save up your money and you buy this high-end laptop, it would be $2,000 today. But if instead you put the charge on this laptop on your credit card and you pay only the monthly minimum payment of say $50 a month, look what happens here. It takes you almost five years to pay off that laptop and look how much you end up paying for it, almost 50% more and after five years, that laptop may not have enough speed for you. It may not ha have enough memory or RAM. So using credit costs money. Now, good news, about half of us pay off our credit cards every month. So we're living within our means. We, we do incur charges on our credit card, but then we pay them off immediately. We don't incur interest charges. Uh, but for the other half of us, we engage in one or more very expensive credit card behaviors between carrying a balance, occasionally missing a payment, that's a late fee on top of the interest charges, uh, or using our credit card as an ATM, like for a cash advance, which is a very expensive way to use your credit card. I wanna point out that your credit score is this financial barometer, right? It's this number between 300 and 850, and it essentially tells lenders, banks, student loan issuers, how likely we are to pay back the money that we borrow. That's the primary purpose, I think, of a credit score. But remember, credit scores are also used by landlords who may consider whether you're the type of person they wanna rent their home to. Credit scores are used by potential employers who may look at your credit score and decide if you're the type of person they wanna to add to their team. So. We want to protect our credit score for those tangential reasons, uh, but I think the primary reason we want to protect our credit score is because it costs more money to borrow if we have an impaired credit score. So look at these two examples. On the left, this person has a tremendous score, somewhere between 760 and 850. When she goes to PNC Bank or USAA or the local credit union, they're able to offer her a very good rate of 3.7%, and that translates into a monthly payment on a $200,000 mortgage of $927. Her friend who's gonna buy the house right next door, same size house, same square footage, same $200,000 30-year fixed mortgage, has a slightly impaired credit score. His score is somewhere between 620 and 639, and the best rate he gets at the bank or credit union is 5.3%. And that translates to an $1,116 monthly payment. And I can hear you out there saying, hey, no big deal this month, no big deal next month or the month after that. But over the 30 year course of that mortgage, he ends up paying almost $80,000 more for the same, same uh, almost $70,000 more I should say, for the same mortgage simply because his credit score was impaired at the time that he went to get the mortgage. So we want to protect our credit score and we don't want to pay extra when we take out a mortgage or take out a car payment to buy a car. Our friends at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau have put out some really nice guidelines on how you can improve your credit score, some of which are obvious. Um, you know, pay your bills on time. If you haven't gotten into that habit yet, Start now. Pay the whole credit card bill off each month. If you're in over your head and you unfortunately can't do that based on your income, then by all means, be aggressive. Pay it down as fast as you can. Make more than just that monthly minimum payment and try to get rid of your high interest debt. Um, don't get right up against your credit limit. If the credit card is issued a $10,000 limit, you don't wanna charge $9,000 on that card because at least temporarily, you're gonna impair your credit score. Um, hold on to your cards because a long credit history helps you, but don't take out cards that you don't need. Don't apply for credit uh, that you really don't need. 
You know, when you're at TJ Maxx and they say that, you know, you could have saved an additional 10% if you open up a TJ Maxx card today, think long and hard whether you really need a retailer's credit card. Make a good decision because the more you open, the more you, ting, you ding your uh, credit score, at least temporarily. And check your credit report regularly. There's a website that allows you to do this at least once every year uh, for each of the three credit rating agencies, and that's annualcreditreport.com. And some folks say you might want to check Equifax this month, check Experian, uh, say, four months later, and check TransUnion four months after that, and then you get a nice uh, window to your credit score throughout the year. Okay. That's all I have on uh, credit because our specialty obviously is on saving and investing. I want to get into that, but you can't teach it in a vacuum. And so, Sue, I'll stop here. Were there questions on credit and debt before I move on to saving and investing? No, I don't see any questions at this time, but I just did want to point out, in case people don't know, that in Maryland, uh, people have a right to get an extra credit report. So you're referring to the one under the federal law, which is awesome, but we also in Maryland have a right to get a free credit report Oh, let me check this one question. Um, oh, someone is saying hi to you, Franca. Uh, so <laughs> we will make sure that people know in Maryland that residents do have a right to get a copy of their credit report under Maryland law as well. So that's Thank it. you, Sue. That's very important to know. Okay, let's dive into saving and investing. Uh, you know, saving's important. We save money for education, to start a family, maybe to buy a house. Uh, but I would urge you to save money for expenses that you can't quite foresee today. The Federal Reserve did a study a year or two ago that showed that four in 10 Americans, 40% of us, would not be able to incur a $400 unexpected charge. In other words, for 40% of us, if we drop this phone, crack the screen, we need to borrow money from a family member or put it on a credit card and pay it off over a long period of time because we don't have an emergency fund. You need to have an emergency fund because life throws us curveballs and we don't want to have to go into debt to cover unexpected expenses. A good guideline is try to work toward having a about three to six months of your living expenses saved. That's daunting. That's intimidating. I would settle for, try to put $25 per pay period into a checking or savings account that's liquid, that's safe, you know you can get to it. And as you do this over time, over 10, 15, 20 pay periods, before you know it, you've, begot, you've built up uh, a, a substantial emergency fund that you can use to cover unexpected expenses. Take advantage of those one-off opportunities. If you get a tax refund this year, put it toward your emergency fund, or at least some part of it. You get a gift money from a birthday or a holiday, that's another good excuse to bulk up your savings. Uh, and try to do it automatically. It's much better to set a automatic deposit into your savings account that happens every pay period without you having to, to manipulate it than to make a decision at the end of the month whether you have enough money to save. Because believe me, some other of life's pressing goals will squeeze out your savings goals if you do it that way. Now, saving, of course, is a little different than investing. That's the money we earn but we don't spend. When we get savings, we typically put them in a bank instrument. So it's uh, safe. It's FDIC insured, or if it's in a credit union, it's NCUA insured. It's liquid. We can get right to it. But what kind of returns are we getting on a bank instrument? Very modest. Okay, for most of us, that's less than a percent. For most of us, it's less than a quarter of 1%. Uh, so while it's safe money and we need that for our emergency fund, it's not the portion of our overall portfolio that we want to grow over time. That's what investing is. Investing is money that we want to grow. And in order to get that potential for growth, what do we have to do with investing? Well, we have to put our money at risk. Now, one of the reasons we're willing to put our money at risk is because the cost of goods and services tend to go up over time. We call that inflation. This simple example here just shows one particular make and model of a car, a Ford Mustang convertible GT. 25 years ago was under $23,000. In the year 2020, it's double, okay? Uh, and it's not just Ford Mustangs that 
increase in price as time goes on. It's the food that we eat. It's the housing that we rent or buy. It's the schooling and the tuition that we pay. Uh, all the goods and services that we avail ourselves of tend to get more expensive over time. And so we can't just put that money in a coffee pot in the backyard and expect to have the same purchasing power years from now. Part of that money needs to grow, and that's why we invest. Now, how does money grow through investing? If it's in a bank instrument, that's called compound interest. If it's in a stock, a bond, a mutual fund, an ETF, we call it compounding. That money grows over time. Uh, and the, just to take one simple example here, if you put a thousand dollars in the first year of your career into say a mutual fund that paid 7% average return over time, you would have almost $15,000 after 40 years, by the time you retire. And that's assuming you never put another penny in, just that one time only, $1,000 investment growing over time. And you can see the gray bar at the bottom of the uh, graph here is your money, the money you put in. The pink shaded area is the growth. It's the compounding. It was how your money was working for you over time and your money tends to work for you better the longer you invest it. Look how it starts to work even more as the years and the decades go on. And so that's how compounding works. I think of it as a, a snowball. When you roll that first rotation of a snowball, it might be as large as a, say a softball, but because it's picking up more snow as you roll it, your, your investments are earning interest or returns and then the earn, re, returns and the interest that your investments earn are also earning interest and returns. So like a snowball, each further rotation has more surface area, picks up more snow. It gets larger as it goes down the hill or up the hill in this particular circumstance. And so we want our money working for us. That's the power of compounding. We don't want our money working against us, uh, the tyranny of, of the interest that we might pay in by having a, ro a revolving balance with a credit card company, paying interest out instead of earning interest in. Now, do, do investments earn money every year? And is it guaranteed? It is not guaranteed. And no, they don't earn money every year. If you look at, for example, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is one of the stock indicators, um, it looks more like a heart monitor or an EKG as you look at it. There are ups and downs and it, 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 it's somewhat volatile in short periods of time. But if you look at any given five or 10 or 15 or 20 year period, the trajectory is up. Stocks have done well historically over time. And so that's, that's sort of my, um, my pitch for folks who might be too afraid of volatility because on any given day, week, month, there may be significant ups and downs. We've certainly seen that in 2020 during the COVID crisis where the market has taken quite a roller coaster ride since March. Um, but the long-term trajectory has historically been positive. Um, if you'd like to play around a little bit with either your own savings and investing goals or perhaps a client that you're working with, you can use our compound interest calculator on investor.gov. It allows you to put in that initial amount, say you're going to put $500 into the account. It allows you to put the monthly contribution that you're willing to consider, say $100 a month or whatever. Uh, you can put in an assumed interest rate. I always use 7%. You can use what you think might be reasonable and then see how quickly you can build wealth on some of these saving and investing models. It's a lot of fun to play around with. And it also happens to be our most popular tool and page on investor.gov. I'm gonna short circuit this one to simply say, the earlier you start, the more wealth you can build. Somebody who only contributed $2,000 a year for 10 years of their life, between the ages of 18 and 28, ends up having more money invested at the age of 65 than someone who begins at the age of 35 and goes for 35 years of diligent investing the same $2,000. Why? Because the person who starts at 18 
has the power of compounding working for her over a longer period of time. You really do want to put this money to work for you early. I just read a, uh, a, stock, rep, uh, a, a stock article that said uh, one person's take on it was the money you invest in your 20s is the most important investing you do in your life. And I, I really like that quote because that's the money that has the most time to work for you over time. Um, so as a further example, if you wanted to have a quarter million dollars at the age of 65, if you start at the age of 25, you'd only have to put $104 a month into an investment that will assume averages 7% over time. But if you wait to the age of 55, you have to put $1,500 a month into your investment to get to that same quarter of a million dollar goal. If you wanted a half million dollars, $209 a month at the age of 25, and you wait all the way to 55, you have to put $3,000 a month into an account to get to that half million dollar goal. So clearly it's less expensive, it's less onerous on your monthly bill to start saving and investing earlier rather than to play catch up later in life. Automatic's the way to go. Do small amounts matter? They can, they can really add up. This $50 a month example, there's your one venti coffee every school day or every work day. Does it add up? Yeah, $3,400 after five years if you would instead invest it in an investment that averages 7%. $8,200 after 10 years. And you'd have almost $25,000 if you did this for 20 years. So yeah, small amounts, modest amounts can add up over time when we're talking about investing. All right, I already said this, but it's worth repeating. All investments have risk. It's the risk we're willing to take on because you have a potential for higher return. And different type of investments have different types of risk. But here's a relationship we need to memorize. In investing, the potential for higher return typically comes with what? Higher risk. So you see in the bottom left corner of this uh, graph, our cash products like the bank account products, checking, savings, CDs, money markets, they have very low risk. I'd argue no risk. They're FDIC insured. They, they, they will be there for you. They're liquid, but they pay very modest returns, almost no growth. As you move up, on average, bonds have generally paid historically a um, moderate rate of return, say, 3%, 4%, 5%, depending. Uh, and bonds have been about, on average, in general, of modest risk. And stocks, stocks have done well. Stocks have paid between 8 and 10% return, and that goes all the way back to the stock market crash of 1929. However, any given company's stock might present considerable risk, okay? because individual companies have, can be impacted by market influences, by competitors, by international uh, tariffs or, or, or politics, by natural disasters, by change of leadership, anything. Different types of factors can affect a single company or a single sector. So there is considerable risk uh, in stocks, but they have a potential upside that is quite good. Now, a refresher course, bonds, bonds are those IR, IOUs, loans, that we make to either a government entity or to a corporation. They hold our money for some length of time. They pay us interest. It's usually twice a year. And it gives us a predictable income stream. And then at the end of that term of the bond, we get our principal back. That's the money we initially invested. Do bonds have risks? They do. Um, Two that are worth mentioning is, you know, you're locking into an interest rate. And so if inflation goes up during the period that you're holding that bond, your real return that you get can be cut into. Um, another risk is that when you're going to sell your bonds in the secondary market, if bond interest rates have gone up in the interim, so now your Amazon bond that you got for 3% over 10 years, uh, if Amazon is now issuing bonds at 4%, for example, the price that some investor out there is going to be willing to give you for your 3% bond is going to be lower 
okay? Because they could just go to, straight to Amazon and get the 4% bond. So keep in mind that when you go to sell your bonds, the, if bond interest rates have gone up, the price you're going to get for your bond will go down. It's like a, a seesaw or an inverse relationship. Stocks are a little different. Stocks are where we own a portion of a company. You can be a co-owner of Snapchat a publicly traded company, right? And you can make money at least two ways. One is you can buy low and sell high. You can get capital appreciation when, you, when share prices go up in the interim between your purchase and sell. Uh, another way you might earn money is if it's a company that shares its profits with shareholders. We call those dividends. Not all companies do this, but some do. Um, but Stock prices can go down too, and companies can go bankrupt. And so with any investment, you can lose some or all of your investment. That's, um, that's the nature of the beast. Um, is time your friend or your foe when you're considering, for example, stock investing? Well, these are stocks. Uh, this is stock, uh, large stock performance ever since the 20s all the way up through the end of last year. And one thing you see when you first look at this chart is substantial volatility. You see stalactites and stalagmites. Um, and some of those downs are, you know, obviously historical events we can remember, like the dot-com bubble bursting in 2000 and 2001, uh, or the 2008 housing crisis and, and Great Recession. But if you look a little closer here, I hope you all notice there are more ups than downs. Um, and that's part of the reason that explains that stocks have paid between 8 and 10% historically. Uh, and now, so I take away two lessons from this chart. Uh, the first lesson is, if you are young, if you have a long-term horizon of investing ahead of you, let's say you're in your 20s and you realistically have 40 more years of investing, then time tends to be your friend and stocks make a lot of sense to be a big portion of your portfolio. Why? Because you can take advantage of that historic return that stocks have had and you can weather those inevitable market corrections that will come over the next 40 years. You can weather them because you have time to recover from them. So even when stock prices take big hits, they tend to recover eventually and sometimes very quickly. Um, and so the lesson for a younger person with a long-term time horizon is stocks can be your friend. Time can be your friend. You have the time to seek more returns and to weather uh, any corrections or dips in the market. If, however, you plan to retire next year, you're in your 60s perhaps, um, Time may not be your friend, and the substantial portion of your portfolio may not want to be in stocks because you don't have as much time to recover if there's a market correction or dip. And so what you see folks who are nearing retirement do is uh, converting their investments into more conservative mixes like bonds or treasuries or cash products that the bank might offer. Now, one of the ways to manage the risk of investing is by not putting all of your assets into one basket. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Uh, if you had all of your net worth in Snapchat stock and another competitor came along that did social media or short videos better, or if Snapchat had a, a scandal and, and lost one of their officers and directors, or if uh, technology made, made, you know, internet posting difficult for some period of time, or advertisers no longer wanted to use the company, your, all your money in Snapchat stock would re result in a very big hit to your net worth because you, you put all your eggs in one basket. But if instead you would consider products like mutual funds and ETFs, these are products where investors pull their money and instead of buying only Snapchat stock, they might buy 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 different securities to distribute their investment among many different companies, many different sectors. And the point of products like mutual funds and ETFs is diversification, okay? This is how diversification looks if you would show it graphically. 
This is one single day in the life of the S&P 500. All 500 companies are represented here. And if they're colored green, they went up that day. And if they're colored red, they went down that day. And so to take an example, if you had Microsoft, for example, on the left side, if you only had Microsoft stock, you had a bad day. But if you had this whole S&P 500 index fund, um, you can see through the green, you, you may have even broken even or posted gains that day. And so that's the theory of diversification, that when one particular company or one sector takes a hit, when you're diversified, you may uh, be safer with by having uh, exposure to a larger portion of the market. Now, remember, when we're talking fund investing, like some mutual funds, ETFs, when we're talking about the offerings typically that we get on a workplace 401k, there are at least two types of funds that you may have to choose from. One is this actively managed fund where you have analysts making a lot of research. You have brokers buying and selling different stocks every single day. They're always trying to beat some sort of market index. And then the other uh, type of fund is this passive fund or index fund where you just have a basket of particular securities and as the market of those securities goes up, you go up. If it goes down, you go down. Remember that when you're considering these, actively managed funds on, uh, in general have higher fees than index funds. And so the average actively managed fund uh, has to do that much better in returns to make up for the higher fees that you would be paying. So always pay attention to fees as you consider investing because they matter. They gobble up your returns. We wanted to show this definitively, uh, and we did an investor bulletin taking a $100,000 hypothetical portfolio over a period of 20 years at three different fee structures. The green line that you see in front of you is a full point, $1 fee. The red line is a half point fee, and the blue line is a quarter point fee, something you might see more typically on, a, on an index fund or, or a passive fund. At the end of 20 years, no big difference in the first few years, but at the end of 20 years, if you had the quarter point fee, you'd have $30,000 more in your fund than if you paid the full point fee, assuming, uh, assuming average interest. Here we used 4% as a proxy. So believe me when I tell you, fees can really add up and it, you want this to be one of your data points when you're considering funds. One easy way, of course, you can check the prospectus and the, the offering documents of any particular fund and the fee data is in there. But if you wanna do an apples to apples comparison of multiple funds, FINRA has a really great tool called Fund Analyzer. You can Google it, Fund Analyzer. And they have 35,000 different mutual funds and ETFs and you can get the overall expense ratio. That's all the fees together. So that say you're starting a new job, it's day one, right after they talk to you about their dental plan, they talk to you about the 401k offerings. Maybe they have five different funds you can choose from. Put all five funds in Fund Analyzer and make sure that one of your data points as you consider which fund to choose is the cost. It will cost you to hold that fund over time. Okay, we're gonna get into retirement now, but before we uh, do, let me see if there are any questions about compounding, about risk and return and investing, about diversification, or about fees. Uh, Sue, were there any questions? Uh, so there was one question, um, actually kind of back to the time when you were talking about um, the credit scores. So one participant oh. mentioned that uh, she had a 10 point drop recently, um, but always pays on time and did not get a new card. So I think she's wondering as to what the thoughts are or why she could have had a 10 point drop. Yes, yeah, so there is a very complex formula that goes into your credit score. I'm not an expert on this. However, our friends at CFPB have a really good website called consumerfinance.gov. Consumerfinance.gov. Maybe someone will type it in the chat box. You can go there, go to their credit section, a credit score section, and you'll see FAQs and lots of good information on how this works. It's a complex formula that starts with how much available credit there is, how much of that available credit you're using, how frequently you're paying on time, etc. 
nothing that you said immediately would would lead me to think you did something that would impact your score. By the way, a 10-point drop is not significant, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. But check out consumerfinance.gov for more information on credit scores. Thank you, Tom. And I would just also add, just in case, um, I totally agree, 10 points is not significant, but go ahead and check your credit report. As Tom mentioned, it's very important to do that just in case something has been opened up that you're not aware of. Good point. Good point. And now the number one reason so many of us re, uh, invest is because we want to stop working someday. And studies have shown that, you know, Social Security makes up about one third of what the average retiree needs to live in retirement. The other two thirds is up to us. OK, now, if you're lucky enough to have a job that pays a pension, pension is an automatic payment you get after you retire, like a teacher, like a fireman, a policeman, a, a military member who serves 20 years, well, then you've gone a long way toward making up that other 67%. But for the vast majority of the rest of us, it's up to us to start planning for retirement early, to put that best money to work for us in our 20s and in our 30s and in our 40s so that it has time to grow for us. Because for most of us, what we get is a uh, defined contribution plan like a 401k where the amount of money we'll have in retirement depends on how much we put into the investment and ideally how much our employer might add to it in terms of matches. Let me remind you, you want that 500 grand by age uh, 65, you start at age 25, you only have to put $209 a month in. If you wait to age 50, you have to put eight times as much per month for that same goal. And look, look at the pink line here. The pink line is your money working. Uh, uh, the pink line is how much you're putting in. If you wait to age 50, look how much more you have to put in to get to that lofty goal. Whereas that gray bar or light blue bar here uh, is your money working for you. And if you start at 25, so much more of your money works for you. At 50, it doesn't have as much time to, to work on your behalf. And of course, one of the best ways to do this type of saving, what I think is the primary or first building block of investing is taking advantage of tax advantage accounts like your workplace retirement account or an IRA. Okay, why do we do this? Because we get tax breaks. We have incentives to make contributions to work to retirement accounts. Congress set this up because they want to encourage us to make these types of investments. Uh, you can put $19,500 annually into a 401k or 403b. Uh, 6,000 you can put into an IRA on your own. You can do this on top of your 401k. Okay, or if you don't have a workplace employer, it might be your only uh, retirement account. Um, it grows and uh, you have some choices of investments uh, to make within them. Now, I said it gives you a tax advantage. That depends whether you want that tax advantage now or later. It's great either way, believe me. The, in either uh, example here, it's an incentive to save for retirement. When you make traditional contributions, it lowers your taxable income this year. You, you, it's, uh, you put your money in, it grows throughout your career, and then when you go to take that withdrawal or that distribution out in retirement, you will pay taxes at that point on a traditional contribution. But it'll be at your tax rate in retirement, and for many of us, that's a lower tax rate than while we're working. Roth, on the other hand, we're gonna put in after-tax money, so we're gonna pay the taxes this year. But then that money grows throughout our career. And when we take those distributions or uh, withdrawals in retirement, they're tax free. And believe me, your 70 year old self will thank you if you've made Roth contributions to a retirement account because you don't pay taxes then. When does Roth make the most sense? It makes the most sense when your pay is relatively low and your tax bracket because your pay is low is also relatively low. So taking the tax hit earliest in our career when our salary is modest makes a lot of sense to contribute by Roth. Uh, as you get later in your career and your, your, your salaries presumably go up and maybe you go up into a higher tax bracket, well, that's when maybe traditional makes more sense. You can make both types of contributions. Um, you can split it uh, and you can talk to a financial professional if you, if you have questions on what makes sense for you. 
And another way to consider uh, your investing, you know, you certainly can change your asset allocation throughout your career. Like I said earlier, when you have 40 years to go till retirement, maybe stocks make a lot of sense. But then as you move throughout your career, you may want to become a little more conservative as you approach retirement. Well, target date funds allow you to do that. It's almost like investing uh, on autopilot. They change the makeup of your investments from aggressive early in your career to a more conservative mix as you approach retirement when asset preservation becomes more important to you. Start that new job, please ask on day one, do we have a workplace retirement plan? You got a 401k? Um, oh yeah, you do. How much do you match? Find that out. If they say up to 5%, how much should you contribute to that? 401k? Well, I would argue at least 5%. Otherwise, you're leaving a portion of your hard-earned compensation on the table. You're not drawing down every dollar you've earned. Uh, ideally, you're going to put 10% or more into your uh, workplace retirement plan, but at least 5% if the employer matches 5%. Okay. S don't delay. Start early. We already saw twice how important time is to investing. Your money works for you more if you start early. Take advantage of any employer match. You build wealth that much faster when your employer is matching your contributions to your 401k. Invest consistently. You don't stop investing because the market's down. Uh, when the market is up and you're putting a regular contribution into a fund, you're actually acquiring fewer shares of that fund because the market's up. It's expensive. When the market dips like it did in March and April, you might think, I got to get out. But in fact, if you continue putting that regular contribution in, you're acquiring more shares because the share price has gone down. And that, keeps, that leaves you poised for a big gain when the market returns. So invest consistently. They call that dollar cost averaging. It's an important concept. Keep going. Don't back out. Go throughout your career in good markets and bad, and you'll, you'll be pleasantly surprised with the results after a long period of time. Um, and pay attention to fees. Uh, fees can gobble up your returns. Now, important to note, these 401ks I'm talking about, they stay with you. They don't, you don't lose those when you change jobs. Millennials will change jobs six to 10 times in the next 20 years. You keep the money you put in a 401k. And so one of your options is to keep it in that former employer's plan if it's allowed. Another option is when you go to that new employer and they have a 401k, you could roll in your prior plan into the new plan. And generally that's a tax-free transaction. Uh, you could also roll it into your own individual retirement account if you have one of those. Uh, can you take money out? Can you use retirement money for a new car? Yes. You can. Should you? I would argue you should not. Uh, when you take a distribution from a 401k or a retirement plan prior to the age of 59 and a half, you're not only going to pay the taxes on that, but you will have a significant 10% penalty and you might only end up with 50 cents on the dollar of these types of withdrawals. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense because you can get a loan for a car. You can get a loan for a house. You can get a loan for college or uh, grad school. You cannot get a loan for retirement. And so this is important money and it's, you're gonna need this money. Uh, and so think long and hard before you take distributions from a retirement plan. Okay, before I jump into our last section, which is fraud, uh, are there any questions about retirement, 401k? Yes, Tom, there was a question about, is it better to pay off student loan debt or get a head start on investing? Well, it's a good question. Um, with student loan debt, typically your interest rate is going to be 5%, 6%, 7%, 8%. It's not what I consider high interest debt. And so I don't have the exact knee-jerk reaction that I had earlier when I was talking about credit card debt or retailer debt that could be 12, 15, 20, 25%. Uh, and so uh, I think ideally maybe you want to consider doing both paying down your student loan debt and investing, uh, beginning your investing journey, especially, I'll say, if 
you work for an employer that has a 401k and if that employer matches, because then uh, you would be leaving the match on the table if you didn't take advantage of it. So try to do both. And uh, especially when you have a, a plan that matches. All right, we just have another question as well. Uh, for the lump sum distributions, my retirement plan allows deferred taxes over three years. It says COVID distribution. How does the IRS handle this? Yeah, I should say there have been some special allowances uh, recently in COVID times that ease the restrictions on taking withdrawals or distributions from these plans. Um, check irs.gov. That's the IRS's website, irs.gov, and go to uh, IRA or plan distributions for, for the specific roles. Uh, I, I'm not an expert on those, but I would still say if you can afford to, to access money elsewhere, consider it, but uh, there are some easing restrictions right now that you can, you can learn more about. Thanks, and that's it for questions right now. Awesome. Let's let's go into our last section here. Um, I'm not going to show this video, but this video is uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. He played a real life person by the name of Jordan Belfort in the movie Wolf of Wall Street. He does a cold call to a prospective investor and he pitches him on some company uh, that he says has a great upside trading at 40 cents going to go up to four dollars a share has some great technology on radar that could be used by civilians and, and, and the Department of Defense, and he gets this guy to buy. I want you not to make the mistake that the guy on the phone made in the movie. And one mistake is he didn't see any of the red flags of fraud, one of which is sounds too good to be true. Believe me, when something sounds too good to be true in investing, it probably is, you should walk away. When someone's on the phone berating you and trying to pressure you to buy right now, also walk away. No legitimate investment requires you to make a rash decision. That's a beautiful thing about investing. You can take your time, do your due diligence. If there's no documentation, that guy talking on the phone obviously wasn't seeing documentation. He was just hearing representations from somebody over the phone. You want to look at a prospectus. You want to look at the audited financials. You want to make sure there are public filings and th this thing is legit, not a bogus thing that somebody made up to steal your money. And this point is critical. If a person trying to get you to buy or sell securities or giving you adv investment advice is not licensed or registered, walk away. So many of the scams the Securities and Exchange Commission sees are in this space, this unregistered, unlicensed space, uh, and that's the problem. When somebody comes to you, it's already a problem, okay? I don't want you to make an investment decision based on somebody cornering you after church about an investment or inviting you to some free steak dinner at the local hotel or sending you an email or a social media post or some stock newsletter. These are the, that's the wrong way to initiate your investing decisions. The right way is you to go out and choose how you want to invest. Go to your HR department and say, do we have a 401k? I want to participate go to some inexpensive, low fee, diversified fund and say, I would like to, you know, go on their website and sign up for a fund that has low fees and, and, and diversification and that fits your, your risk tolerance and your time horizon. That's the best way. Ignore the folks who come to you. Now, the first step you have to take to avoid scams is to make sure any investment professional you use, if you're going to use an investment professional, is licensed and registered. You can do this on Investor.gov about as quick as you can do a Yelp review for the nearest restaurant in the Inner Harbor of Baltimore. Um, you want to make sure they're registered. If they are, it'll be in green. Uh, if there are red disclosures indicated. Uh, disclosures are sort of marks that are worthwhile to take a look at. They might be deal breakers depending on you. It's a disclosure regime, but you make the decision on whether they're deal breakers. And this is how it might look. You look somebody up on investor.gov. You see that in green, they are a registered investment advisor. They are a registered broker, but there's a disclosure reported. So here we want to get the full report. And on this particular example, the guy has nine disclosures, uh, including a customer dispute and an employee separation after allegations. Okay, you want to 
click on those and get the details and make sure this is someone you would want to invest your life savings with or your any investment with. Make sure you're comfortable. You can also see this person's been in the industry 22 years. They bounced around to eight firms. They've taken three exams and they hold two licenses. So this is the kind of information you can glean from a background search on investor.gov. Now, the second thing you wanna do, make sure if you're working with an investment professional, they're licensed. The second thing is research the investment. OK, if it's a publicly traded company and if or if it's a fund, you will find them on our Edgar system, Edgar Electronic Database Gathering and Retrieval. OK, you can look them up. You can see who are their officers and directors. Are those officers and directors trading their own stock? Um, look at the audited financials. Are they mired in debt or are they flush with cash? Uh, look at the filings that they're required to make with the SEC. There's going to be quarterly filings and annual filings. And when there are material or important events, there will be 8Ks and other type of filings that tell you what's going on at the company. And important to note, you see there on the bottom center, how to research public companies. If you've never used Edgar before, or even if you have and need a refresher, check this out because it's a tutorial on how to use Edgar to look through these reports and get real information. Um, if the company's not on Edgar, be careful. The less disclosure, the less transparency, the more risk. And so be careful when you're dealing with investments that simply aren't publicly registered. Now, some fraud is going to be directed at you simply because of your membership in some group. Maybe you're an alumnus of uh, uh, UMBC. Maybe you're a uh, Maybe you go to a particular church or synagogue. Maybe you served in a particular military branch. You're going to let down your guard because it's natural for us to trust people that have some common element with us, but don't. Even if they go to your church and live in your neighborhood, make sure they're licensed and registered and do your due diligence on the investment that they are pitching. Here's a few really good tips. If someone claims to be from the government and they're seeking a payment, don't believe it. Check it out yourself. You get a call from the IRS, hang up, go to the actual IRS website, irs.gov, call their number and say, hey, I, was, I received a call saying I, I owe a payment. Can you verify this? Chances are it's not true. Or the SEC, go to the sec.gov website and call us. We would be willing, we're more than willing to uh, verify whether we're seeking money. We don't, we don't, demand money through emails and phone calls at the SEC and very, I don't know any government agency that does. Never pay for your investments with credit cards, gift cards, or wires sent overseas. That's a hallmark of a scam. Don't speak to unknown salespeople, but if you do because you're nice, don't give them your information, your mother's maiden name, your brokerage account number, your social security number. Keep that close to the vest. I don't even pick up if I don't recognize a number that calls me. And never pay an upfront fee to claim some proceeds, all right? You did not win a lottery. It is not the case that you have to pay those taxes for the lottery before you can claim your winnings. There's no such lottery that works that way. All right, and by all means, when you're moving through your investing journey, no matter where you are, use investor.gov. We've got great tools and resources on there. You can see, you can check out your investment professional right in the center of the page. Um, you can get information on introduction to investing. All of our tools and calculators are on here. How to avoid scams and protect your investments. Uh, we've got pages for teachers. We have a page for the military, for librarians. Uh, so for seniors, check out investor.gov, really good stuff. Um, planning tools. That's how it looks on a, a uh, phone. We've got those calculators. Here's just a few of our recent alerts and bulletins, and you can sign up to receive these every as they get posted. Um, we try to have timely uh, alerts that tell about fraud and scams that we're seeing, and we also have uh, investor bulletins that talk about uh, investment products or trends that you should be aware of. Uh, we have publications. And uh, an investor preparedness checklist goes through a lot of the things we talked about today. Pay off high interest debt first, participate in your 401k, take advantage of any match, et cetera. 
and, and there are ways we can help, okay? If you have questions about your investment professional or your investment, call us, 800-732-0330, or email us, help at sec.gov. We'd love to hear from you. We have Facebook. We have Twitter. Please like us, follow us. Uh, and finally, if there is ever an audience uh, that could benefit from this type of conversation we had today and you'd like to invite us, you can send those invitations to outreach at sec.gov and we'd be, uh, we'll try to say yes, outreach at sec.gov. And with that, Sue, I'll turn it back to you and see if there are any final questions. Awesome, Tom, thank you so much. This has been great information. Um, I really agree with your uh, concept of how important it is to, to start investing, but to invest in a very smart way so that you're protecting yourself and your dollars and doing the best you can with them. So really appreciate all this great information. I'll give it one second for any final questions. I'm not seeing anything on um, Facebook Live yet as well, so. I think we're, we're good for questions at this point. Again, this is being recorded and will be put on Cash Academy by next week. So people can share this with uh, friends, family, colleagues, and, and please get out the great information that was shared here today. So again, Tom, thank you so much for your time. Participants, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to participate in this website and webinar and just really hope everyone stays safe and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Sue, and thank all of you.